Well, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Um, I'm really surprised to see so many people in the, in the audience again. Thank you very much. Um, today we're going to do a session called Seven Ways to Fail as a Wireless Expert. Um, who's seen the session before? Wow, OK. So we have some people that <laughs> come back. Wow. Uh, for the people that are coming back, uh, tomorrow I have another session called Seven New Ways to Fail. OK, so this is going to be the repetition of last year with a, s a small updates. Tomorrow is going to be all brand new. Okay. It's uh, uh, 11.30 in room uh, 112. All right, so let's get started. Um, a quick introduction about myself. Um, I will explain what we're going to do and why. We're going to set the baseline. Uh, can we do the audio a little bit less uh, met metallic? <laughs> I sound like a robot right now. Um, we will set the baseline, so it's the basics of, of Wi-Fi. We're going to look into fill one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and we will look at the bonus fill. The reason why I created this session is not because I think I have more knowledge than you. I think all of you in the room are experts already. You know a lot more than I do. However, uh, a lot of you have problems explaining uh, to IT management uh, uh, CEOs in your company what's the issue with your infrastructure. You're not finding the right words. So what I want to do is give you the tools and, and the way to explain it to the people that are non-technical uh, of what's the issue with Wi-Fi. So a quick introduction about myself. Um, this is my Twitter handle. If you want to follow me on Twitter, this is where to find me. Uh, I've been an end user for three years. I started working in 1998. Uh, I worked as a partner uh, for five years. I was a field engineer. I did a lot of uh, call manager express installations, actually. I was a voice engineer. Uh, I worked for a distributor for six years. I'm with Cisco now uh, seven years, and I've been an instructor uh, for the past 13 years. Uh, and in my spare time, which I actually have uh, every now and then, I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a runner. You might not believe it, but I'm a long distance runner. Um, yes. Uh, but I'm a cook, so that's why. I do uh, mountain biking and scuba diving, and I'm a Wi-Fi enthusiast. So I, I'm that guy that walks around on the airport looking at the ceiling where the access points are installed. So. What we're going to do and why, and like I said, I want to give you a way to explain to people around you why certain things are uh, not working. So um, obviously, I'm going to learn you how not to fail, right? Uh, when I created this session, when I created this session, I created an overview with the best practices on Wi-Fi. And it was really, really boring. <laughs> So I decided, you know what, I'm going to flip it around and I'm going to show how to do it wrong. And that worked very well. So when I submitted that to the Cisco Live Commission two years ago, they said, you're sure you're going to submit a session called Seven Ways to Fail? No one will sign up. <laughs> Thanks for joining. So <clears throat> the three biggest fears in our generation, I don't know about you, if, but if I see either one of those three icons, um, I get nervous, right? Uh, um, you're either not connected, and there we have it. Uh, you're either not connected, uh, you are um, uh, having uh, issues to download, or you're running out of battery. And if you want the people in your house to come down to the dinner table, unplug the Wi-Fi. I mean, it's really the biggest fear that we have today that the network is down, right? So we will teach you uh, um, ways to prevent that. Um, I also want to warn you, don't tell your friends that you have this knowledge. Uh, I can tell you from experience, and probably you have the same. Uh, when you're on a birthday party and they're like, ah, you're in IT, right? My computer says this, and you're fixing it. So I spent this year, New Year's Eve, at my, uh, my in-laws, till 5 till 12 in the evening to fix their Wi-Fi. 
Okay, and you're gonna face the same. At the end of the session, I want you to become a wireless superhero and or with, the, with that knowledge. So first, we're gonna set the baseline. The baseline is really about the basics of Wi-Fi and they're applicable to, to everything that we already know in Wi-Fi, okay? Uh, it's not just Cisco. This is for Aruba, for Ruckus, for Aerohive. You, you name the brand, uh, it, it is about Wi-Fi. We're gonna have a quick overview of the, the history. We're gonna look at the standards that are out there, the characteristics of Wi-Fi and the challenges that we see. Um, obviously, we all know that German Wi-Fi is the worst. So, a little bit of history for, for Wi-Fi. Um, people think, and I know not in this audience, uh, but, but a lot of times when you talk about history of Wi-Fi, People think that either Wi-Fi wi has been around for the past 30 years already, we always had it, or they think it's uh, uh, invented for those cell phones, but it's not true. The main driver that we had back in the 90s when it became a standard, does anyone know what, what year it became a standard? 1997, yes, very good. What is the name of the standard? 802.11, yes. 802.11 became a standard in 1997. And the bandwidth we had was 2 meg. 2 meg. That sounded like a huge amount of bandwidth in 1997. I mean, we were still transitioning from Ethernet to fast Ethernet. Token ring was still a thing in 1997, right? And in 1997, how many people actually did have a laptop? Most people didn't. Uh, you did, yes, okay. <laughs> did you put it on your lap? Yeah, even on your lap, okay. So <laughs> wow, it was a big one, yeah. Um, but the cell phones that we had back in those days were not Wi-Fi clients. So the driver for, uh, for Wi-Fi was primarily barcode scanning. And then 2 Mac that we had was, was far sufficient. So no one thought that we would use the same technology 21 years later as the, as the primary access method into a network. So to better understand that, uh, I want you to think of a company with 100 employees, okay? So keep in mind a company with 100 employees. You have it? Yeah, all right. So we're gonna look at the number of Wi-Fi clients on that infrastructure in and I'm company with 100 employees. So we're gonna look at the first, 1999. It became a standard in 1997, right? In 1999, we had 802.11 A and B. In a 100 employee company, how many devices would be on the Wi-Fi? Well, first of all, if the company had Wi-Fi, most companies didn't. If they had Wi-Fi, it was typically a direct e uh, internet connection plugged into an access point in one area of the building, that was the Wi-Fi. So if they had it, there would be one, maybe two devices on the network. The vast majority of employees in a company back in 1999 uh, had a desktop machine. They didn't have laptops like you. And if they had laptops, they typically didn't have a card bus or a PCM CIA card. You would plug it in using a wire. What phone did we have in 99? Nokia, right? Everyone had a Nokia. Was it a Wi-Fi client? No. Then shifting forward to 2005, in the time frame, let me see, there we go. In the time frame uh, 99 to 2005, Intel came with the Intel Centrino chip. And thanks to the Intel Centrino chip, from that moment on, a laptop would have onboard Wi-Fi. And the second thing that happened in the time frame 99 to 2005 is uh, G came to market, 802.11 G. And if you would change your desktop machine, you probably would well, there would be a, a bigger possibility you would get a laptop. If you look at 100 employees, there would be, let's say, 10 laptops in the organization. 
What cell phone did we have in 2005? It was still Nokia. And the second brand that was coming up was Blackberry, right? Then a big shift happened in 2007. And the big shift was, it doesn't work here, ah, there we go. The big shift was the introduction of 802.11n. 802.11n giving us a higher speed and a longer range on both 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. And the second thing that happened was the introduction of 802.11i, what you and I know as WPA2 security. So from that moment on, Wi-Fi actually became secure. So you see that a lot of companies didn't have Wi-Fi in their business, and if they had Wi-Fi, it was only a hotspot function, right? It was only a hotspot. But from 2007 on, more and more companies said to their IT supplier, please design me a wireless infrastructure. And they asked them to design that infrastructure for coverage. How can I cover the entire building with at least possible, uh, at least uh, uh, access points as possible? Why? Because it's cheaper. So they said it has to be a uh, infrastructure based on the latest standard, 802.11n, but hey, we want it cheap. So all the IT customers implemented 802.11n single radio access points. Right? They were on 2.4 gigahertz. And it worked fluently. You had your entire business covered. But there were only 25 clients on that infrastructure. In 2007, we were still using our Nokia E71 phones, right? And our Motorola Sharp, the Motorola Razor, and uh, the, the Blackberry phones. More and more people were having laptops, but everyone would put them in the docking station with a, that was wired. So on 100 employees, there were still only 25, X, 25 uh, clients on the infrastructure. And when you would design that infrastructure for coverage on 802.11n with 2.4 gigahertz, it worked perfectly. Not a problem at all. And then iPhone came to market. It was first the iPhone 3, uh, the iPhone 1 in 2007 wasn't a big success. Not at all. But in 2009, when the iPhone 3G came, it boomed the market. From that moment on, we had Samsung, we had HTC, and all of them became Wi-Fi clients. And this same 100 employee company, all of a sudden, we had 150 devices on the infrastructure. Keep in mind that this infrastructure was designed in this time frame, when there were only 25 clients. Now, all of a sudden, we have 150 clients asking for airtime. That was a big impact. And then in 2010, when the iPad came, you really saw the business ramping up. That was the moment when all the industries, all uh, uh, customers started asking about solid Wi-Fi throughout the building. We saw a new terminology come up. BYOD, bring your own device. That was in 2010 introduced. Today it's a acronym that everyone is like, really, we're going to talk BYOD again? But yeah, that happened in 2010. 2013, two devices per employee. If you have a machine in your network, it's a laptop by default. If you have a phone, it's a smartphone. And everyone has at least two devices. Where we are today is three devices per employee. That has a big impact on the fact that all communication is individually. So I am an access point, and you guys are clients. I have to talk to each and every individual client indirect directly. So I have to talk to you. You acknowledge my message, and then I can move on to the next one. I talk to you. You acknowledge my message. So the more clients I put onto that network, and if I'm an access point talking to each individual client, that has an impact. So, <clears throat> not just the infrastructure and the number of devices uh, uh, have been uh, evolving. We see the laptops, 
This is similar to the machine that you had, right? Yeah. This is 25 years of evolution, what you see here. And the cell phone, 20 years of evolution. I think that most phones have been owned by everyone, right? By the way, I, I really love this one. I had that for many years. Two weeks of the battery, wow. So here we are. This was the phone around 2000. Two weeks on the battery, you can smash it on the floor, it still works. We did have some apps on it. Snake, right? That was it. This is the device that we have today. How many apps on average do we have on this device? Give me a number. On average, 100? It's a little bit less. It's 85. On average, we have 85 apps. Show hands, who's got Facebook on your phone? Facebook on your phone. Okay, and let's say half the audience got Facebook on your phone. Any idea how much bandwidth Facebook generates in the background? So your phone is in your pocket, you're not doing anything on it. You're not looking, you're not browsing, your phone is in your pocket. How much bandwidth does it take from the Wi-Fi? 80 meg, 80 meg per day. If you're browsing, it's a lot more, okay? But if it's in your pocket, it's 80 meg. Now, half of the audience raise their hands. Let's say it's 200 people. 200 people is doing 80 meg a day. This is just one of those apps. And like I told you, I'm an access point and you guys are clients, right? So I'm, as an access point, talking to your phone right now to give you the update on Facebook. And while I'm doing that to your phone, I cannot talk to you. I cannot talk to you. And someone else is sending an iMessage. And someone else is sending a WhatsApp message. And someone else is doing his email. I have to spread the load to all those clients. The more clients I put in the room, the more airtime they require, and the longer it takes. By the way, if you want to see details, we have the VNI index. It's a very interesting index. I can recommend everyone. You don't have to uh, memorize the URL. You can just Google Cisco Virtual uh, Visual Networking Index. You will find an overview we, uh, we submit it every year, and it gives you all the details about uh, uh, how many devices are there, how much bandwidth that they take, what applications. We, we share all that information. It's a big impact on how the industry is changing and how we are using uh, the infrastructure. Keep in mind, still a 100 employee company, right? The 100 employee company, all those employees have those devices in their pockets and they generate that bandwidth. Okay, people think that Wi-Fi is a wireless access point, uh, is a wireless switch but it's a wireless hub, so it's a layer one device. Layer one, half duplex, so I'm either sending or receiving, never at the same time. It's one broadcast domain, it's one collision domain, and it's a shared bandwidth, okay? So the more devices I put in that infrastructure, the more I have to share the load. Keep that in mind when you think about your network. We have the frequency and channels, I will show that in a minute. Uh, modulation is a pretty difficult concept. I try to explain it in a simple way, and we're gonna look at the uh, bandwidth and the data rate impact. So, the basics of Wi-Fi. These are the standards that we have, okay? Uh, looking at the time scale, 8211 became a standard in 1997. Uh, a and B came to market in 99 which was on the 5 gigahertz and the 2.4 gigahertz band. Uh, the bandwidth, 54 and 11. The number of channels, 24 and 13 for the 2.4 gigahertz band, but only three are usable in the 2.4 gigahertz band. A and B came to market almost at the same time. Why was B then still a lot more popular than A? It's a very Dutch answer. It's cheaper. Why? Because the coverage was larger, right? So you needed less access points to cover your entire building. At the same time, all the clients were single radio as well. 
Clients that came to market in 99, 2000, 2001 were single radio. Why? Well, our biggest fear, that little red bar, yes. Coverage, uh, sorry, battery. So if you put in two radios, it drains the battery. Nowadays, the batteries are a lot better. So we can actually do du dual radio. But back then, we couldn't. 2003, G came to market, 2007, N, and 2013, AC. By the way, I'm not mentioning AC wave one and wave two, because wave one and wave two is more a marketing terminology than a standard, because it is just AC. Okay. I will go into the details on how these work in a minute. So, first question, what's the frequency? What is the frequency? What does 2.4 gigahertz mean? 2.4 gigahertz mean these are the radio waves. By the way, on screen they look actually the size that they are. Uh, they are a little bit bigger than reality. Uh, but what does it mean? 2.4 gigahertz means 2.4 billion of these waves in one second. That's what it means, 2.4 billion of these waves in one second. Five gigahertz means five billion of these radio waves in one second. That's a lot, right? So one of the questions that people ask me a lot is, isn't that bad for health? Um, I don't know the details. Uh, I did hear some rumors uh, that if you spend a lot of time in Wi-Fi, you lose your hair. <laughs> but I don't believe that. Um, but I try to, again, I, I want to give you the tools in hand to explain to people around you, because probably you will have the same question from your colleagues about Wi-Fi. Isn't that bad for health? So the first answer is, um, can a wireless access point hurt my brain? And if someone throws it at your head, then yes, it can hurt your brain. Um, but I'll try to give you uh, 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 an answer that you can replicate as well. So let me ask you this question. Who is using the phone as an alarm clock in the morning? Raise your hands. Phone in the, okay. Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Put your hands down if you put it on flight mode. Okay, thank you very much. So again, I think half of the people in the room use your phone as an alarm clock in the morning. Do you have any idea how much uh, voltage or, or wattage comes from a phone in GSM mode? It's one watt, which equals 30 decibel to the milliwatts, which equals 1,000 milliwatts. That's what your phone is on GSM, okay? We use this, we sleep next to it. To put it in perspective on Wi-Fi, let's take your laptop, and your laptop RSSI connected to an AP for 66 dBm. 66 dBm, that's a solid connection. It's not perfect, it's not bad. You have a normal business office connection with a 66 dBm. If you calculate what that means, that is one four millionth of a watt. You're asking questions about Wi-Fi, and you sleep next to this. And I don't know where you carry your phone. I carry it next to my tools. <laughs> is it an answer on is it good or bad for health? No. But if you are worried about radio waves, I would be more worried about that than about the Wi-Fi. Okay. By the way, we do have a detailed report on, uh, uh, on the Wi-Fi testing. So if you want to have that report, you can reach out and we can send it to you. But this is to put it in perspective. So uh, another thing that you saw about Wi-Fi, there are uh, only three channels that are non-overlapping in 2.4. Hmm. So you see in 2.4, we have 13 channels available. In the US, it's 11. In Japan, it's 14. Europe, we have 13 channels available. And all 13 channels overlap. 
However, there is three channels that do not overlap with each other. That's the key word. Now, to, to better understand that, I will show you my radio in my car. I have this radio in my car. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but um, I try to explain it through the concept of a radio, a, a car radio. So um, let's go to the, the radio in your car, and you will have 13 radio channels in your car. Okay, 13 channels. Now each channel is broadcasting its own individual radio station. All 13 channels overlap with each other. So let's see. Let's say in this case you're tuning into channel seven. Do you hear channel seven? No. You also hear channel five, six, eight, and nine. So, how nice do you think is this radio station that you're listening to? You're listening to five radio stations at the same time. One of them you hear pretty okay, but you hear four that are interfering. Is it nice? No. Probably you're going to turn off the radio within 20 seconds, right? So we agreed as Wi-Fi specialists that in this concept of the radio car with the 13 channels, we're only going to use channel 1, 6, and 11 because those are the only channels that do not overlap. So even though you do have 13 channels, we only use 1, 6, and 11. So if you then tune into channel 6, you actually hear channel 6 and nothing else. Okay? This goes for all the Wi-Fi access points for all the brands, including your home. Okay? So the first thing that I want to ask you, when you come back home, log into your access point and see if you're on 1, 6, and 11. That's 1, 6, or 11. If you're not, change it. You can do a channel planning, by the way, with your neighbors. Yes, I did that at the barbecue uh, we had in the neighborhood. I discussed them why we should do this, and uh, honestly, they were happy with it. All right. So in five gigahertz, it's a lot better. In five gigahertz, we have 24 channels available, and as you can see, all of them are non-overlapping. Every channel is 20 megahertz wide, 20 megahertz and none of them overlap, okay? So they came up with a concept called channel bonding. In 802.11n, they said, we're gonna do a thing called channel bonding. We're gonna bond together two channels. We will have double the bandwidth. Sounds good, huh? And it is. They make one big mistake. They said channel bonding is part of the 802.11n standard. They didn't say it's for five gigahertz only. So channel bonding is supported on 2.4 gigahertz. Do not do that, please. If you have a little house in the middle of nowhere with no neighbors, then you can do it. But if you do have neighbors, please, channel bonding is a thing for five gigahertz. So they took 802.11a, 20 megahertz channels. In N, they came up with 40 megahertz channels. And they said, this channel bonding concept works very well. Let's, let's do this again in 802.11 AC. And they came up 80 megahertz wide channels. Okay, that sounds nice. We can do, we can do channel bonding. However, we go from 24 non-overlapping channels back to four non-overlapping channels. And then they said, you know what? We can do this again. We're going to go to 160 megahertz wide channels. So theoretically, we can go to two non-overlapping channels. However, we cannot, they are not consecutive. So you can only use one 160 megahertz wide channel. Then we have another thing called radar in between. And we have our weather uh, Doppler uh, uh, thing in between. Uh, so we came up with a concept called dynamic frequency selection. Basically, we're testing if the medium is free, if they're not detecting a radar. If we detect that radar, we take out that channel. In our newest access points, we have a feature called Flex DFS. And Flex DFS, we 
uh, only take out that one channel and make the other channels still available for 40 or 80 megahertz channels. So what is this? What does this mean? It's not uh, mathematics, no. It's MIMO. Another question that people ask me a lot is, so how do you compare your Cisco AP to an Aruba? How do you compare Aruba to Ruckus? How do you compare to Motorola or Extreme, as they are called today? Uh, how do you compare a Cisco to Meraki? And one of the main things to look at, in my opinion, is this, these numbers. They are really, really important to compare, to make the right comparison. So what do they mean? The first number means the number of transmit antennas. And basically, that's the number of microphones that uh, a client has to talk to an access point or vice versa. So let's say I am an access point. I'm an access point and I'm talking to my clients in the room. But now we're gonna, I'm gonna be uh, an access point, an access point radio, okay? So all the clients that are really close by, you can hear me, but all the people in the back are like, what is he talking about? So I'm gonna put in two microphones and you will hear me like this, okay? The two, the two microphones give me just enough air power to talk to all the clients. If you guys are silent, if you are mumbling, what clients do, clients are mumbling, you will have difficulty to hear me, especially the clients at the back of the room. And I have a secret for you. Wi-Fi also works through the walls. Did you know that? Yes. So I have a client on the other side of the wall connected to me as well. Now I told you earlier on, I'm an access point and I'm talking to all my clients individually. And I want all my clients individually to acknowledge what I said. Did you get what I said? Thank you. So can I move to on to the next client? Did you get what I said? Yeah, thank you. So I'm talking to a client on the other side of the wall because Wi-Fi works through the walls. I'm transmitting to that client and the client on the other side of the wall, do you think he's gonna acknowledge what I say? No. So what am I gonna do as an access point? I didn't get an acknowledgement. I'm gonna send it again. And what will he hear? Is he gonna acknowledge? No. What's gonna happen? I'm gonna retry again and retry again. What is happening with all the other clients in the room? Dude, move on, we get it. But I didn't get an acknowledgement. So either it's gonna time out or the client moved, came into the room, it's like, oh, you were talking to me. Yes, I got your message, thank you. And then I can move on. Now, if I have three microphones, three microphones, the clients on the other side of the wall will hear me like this. So they will hear there's an object in between. It will not be perfect, but will he acknowledge? Yes, he will acknowledge my message. And then of course, four makes it better. It, it will be like this. So there will still be an object in between, but the client will acknowledge the message. The second number is even more important. The second number is the number of ears that an access point has. Keep in mind that 70% of the clients on the infrastructure are what device, do you think? 70% of the clients on your infrastructure. There are these devices. And these devices have one send, one receive, and one spatial stream. So I, as an access point, am talking to a client in the back of the room. And he will hear me loud and clear. But he's talking back to me like this because he's only got one small antenna. And he's not talking very loud because if I talk very loud, I drain the battery. So the number of ears that an access point has is really, really important. The second number is the most important number, in my opinion. The third number is bullshit. <laughs> okay, anyone from marketing in the room? Marketing departments want this number to be as big as possible. Why? Because then they put a higher number on the box. Okay? 
we can run on 1.7 gig. Yeah. How many clients are on the market with four spatial streams? Zero. Yeah. So marketing departments want this number to be as big as possible. So if you look at 802.11n, for instance, with 40 megahertz wide channels, with one spatial stream, you can get to 150. With four spatial streams, we can get to 600 megabits per second. So an 802.11n access point can run on 600 megabits per second. How many clients are there that are four spatial streams? Zero. So 600 megabits per second was in the standard of 802.11n, but it's never brought to market. Hold on, Cisco. I have our Cisco 2600s in our office, and they're 802.11n, and it says in the data sheet, 900 megabits per second. Yes, that's marketing. We put 450 on 2.4, 450 on 5 gigahertz, put together, you get 900 megabits per second. They're advertising the same way nowadays with AC access points. An AC access point with 1.750. How do they do that? 1.3 gig on AC, on 5 gigahertz, plus 450 on 2.4, put together 1.7. It's not Cisco who's doing this. This is doing in all the wireless vendors. This is the way they advertise the bandwidth. So the higher number and the spatial streams, the higher number they put here. 70% of the clients on your infrastructure are one spatial stream. And I do have argues with people that tell me, no, 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 but we're gonna get to two spatial streams. Yes, and your battery will go down. Going back to our biggest fear is the little red bar here. So yes, there are some clients out there with two spatial streams, it's true. But you will not, 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 these devices are not with three, no, no. Um, you will see that this number is not increasing because we want the battery to, to stay up and alive. Uh, and by the way, as a client on your phone, you do not really see the difference between 433 and 867. You really don't see that difference. Your, your, your WhatsApp message will not be sent any faster. Um, if you have a laptop that is about two to three years old, you are probably on uh, uh, two spatial streams. And if you have a high-end new laptop, high-end, it's a more expensive range, they're on three spatial streams. The number of four spatial streams, still no clients out there. Okay. Bandwidth versus channel versus modulation. So you can see the wider the channel, okay, it will give you more bandwidth, more megabits per second, but the wider the channel, the shorter the range. So if you move to 80 megahertz, you will have a longer range. 40 megahertz, you will have again a longer range, and 20 megahertz, you will have the longest range. However, you will get less bandwidth. To better understand that, we go to a concept called modulation. Modulation is basically the fact that you are close to an access point, you have a high bandwidth, the further you're away, you have a lower bandwidth. To better understand that, I took, in this case, an 802.11 N-series access point with two spatial streams, 20 megahertz wide channels, and a 400 uh, millisecond guard interval. When you are close to the AP, you will have media coding scheme 15, giving you 144 megabits per second. And when I'm moving away from the AP, I will have a lower media coding scheme and basically uh, uh, have a lower bandwidth. So we go from 64 qualm to 16 qualm to quadrupole polar shift keying. So basically we change the modulation scheme. To better understand this, I take you to a game called darts. Do you guys watch darts? So um, I use darts because apparently I look like a darter. <clears throat> I'm not sure if that's something to be proud of, but. Um, this is, by the way, Michael van Gerwen, another Dutch guy. Um, so, Michael van Gerwen, he's throwing his dart. He is a client throwing a message at an access point. 
The access point in this case is a 256 QAM, there we go, 256 QAM constellation. And in order to throw his message, he only needs to throw one dart. While he's throwing the dart, everyone in the room needs to be silent. Otherwise, he can't concentrate and he will miss the board. What will happen if he missed the board? He doesn't get an acknowledgement, so he will send it again. So he can only hit this dartboard if he is very close to the dartboard. I mean, if he's far away from it, he will never hit exactly that point, okay? So let's say he threw three darts and he missed. The dartboard will say, you know what? I know I'm too difficult for you right now. Let me make it easier. Let me move to a different constellation. I now go to 64 quam. So in order to get the same message across, he now has to throw four arrows. While he's throwing those four arrows, all the other clients need to be silent. So the advantage is he can hit the same dartboard from a longer distance. The disadvantage, he needs to have more air time, okay? This is, by the way, how the constellation actually looks like. So this is the dartboard where he's throwing the darts on. Okay, so it, it is zeros and ones, after all. So this is a six, uh, 64 quam constellation. Now, let's say he missed again, and now he has to go to a 16 quam constellation. For your information, information 16 quam is still 8 or 211 N speed, okay? This is not a low speed connection. It's still six, uh, 8 or 211 N. But in order to, get to throw the same message, he needs to throw now 12 arrows taking away significant more airtime. And he can do this all the way going back to quadrupolar shift keying. Uh, but in that case, to throw the same message, he needs to throw close to 500 arrows. Can you imagine, as clients in the room, that I'm the darter throwing away 500 arrows? You guys will be waiting a long time. How's the Wi-Fi in your hotel? This is why. All right. So, you understand it? Awesome. Okay, other things that are happening, uh, we have a concept called uh, shadowing, sh shadow of uh, uh, RF signal. Uh, basically, it means that you are connected to an AP and you're walking around and you had a clear line of sight, uh, so uh, uh, the, the constellation between the client and the AP was 64 quam, but now all of a sudden there's a wall in between. Okay, because you're walking around. And the wall in between all of a sudden degrades the performance, so it has to shift to another uh, uh, constellation. Reflection, the same signal bouncing off. Refraction, uh, a signal uh, 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 moves into a uh, different medium. For instance, uh, there's a fog, uh, or uh, it, it moves into water, or you have uh, uh, a lot of trees. Uh, I see uh, uh, camping sites that have been site surveyed in winter. Uh, everything is perfect. And uh, summer comes, uh, the trees have leaves. Leaves are filled with water, and all of a sudden the Wi-Fi doesn't work anymore. That's all refraction. Scattering, the signal bounces in all directions, and diffraction, especially on uh, larger outdoor environments. What else are customers complaining about in Wi-Fi? They say Wi-Fi is slow, they can't connect, they cannot roam, moving from one AP to another. They say it's not secure or not secure enough. Uh, we have to support BYOD. How do we support BYOD? Uh, we have to support guest networks and giving out one username and password for all the guests is not how to do guest networking, okay? Uh, we want coverage everywhere. Uh, we have interference and all sorts of interference. I will show tomorrow in our session, uh, I will show some interference. Uh, changing environments, so when we designed the infrastructure, it worked, but nowadays it doesn't work anymore. Uh, Internet of Things, the five nines of availability. Like I said in the beginning, I used to be a voice engineer, and in voice, uh, asking for five nines of availability is a very common thing. In Wi-Fi, customers are now asking as well. We want it to be 99.99 times available. Wow, okay, so what happens if your AP goes down? Then we have an issue. Or what if your switch goes down? Then all the APs connected to the switch have an issue. 
Um, so there are possibilities to do five nines of availability. We can do it, but it's not as easy as with a, uh, a Ethernet connection. But the main issue that we face today is that Wi-Fi is the primary access method into a network. If you buy a new laptop, an Ethernet port is optional. So you buy a new laptop, it's already ridiculously expensive, and then you say, but I wanted to have an Ethernet connection. They say, oh yeah, here's a $40 ding dongle. So, do we have the basics? Awesome, time to look at some fails. All right. Fail number one, forget about those channels. When you put your access point in the wrong channel, Basically, you take out two parking spots. In this case, you see a guy, a friendly fellow, that parked his car in uh, channel four, and basically he take out channel one and channel six. If you wanna see how this looks like in Wi-Fi, it looks like this. Um, by the way, this is a picture I took in a Cisco office. Um, I'm not gonna mention which one, but it's truly a Cisco office. And uh, this is exactly what's, what's happening. And, you see that um, uh, this is radio channel one, channel six, and channel 11, and you can see that they are pretty much okay, and you will hear only those channels, but this one is interfering uh, basically with everyone around him. So there are several things that you can do about it. Uh, one of them is uh, containment. It's a feature that we have in our access points, right? You can, you can contain certain access points. Uh, by the way, uh, this is illegal in most countries. Um, effectively what you're doing, uh, going to the, back to the car analogy is <laughs> this. So, fail number one is the incorrect usage of channels. Um, this is a picture I took uh, at a hotel uh, in Amsterdam. Um, um, I live in the Netherlands. I work for Cisco, the Netherlands. Um, uh, however, I do live on the Belgian border, so when I have to go to the Amsterdam office, that's a long travel, uh, so if I have to be there early, I typically stay in a hotel. Uh, this is the Wi-Fi that you get in that hotel. Um, as you can see, it's very interesting from a coloring perspective. Uh, however, the channels are all, all over. Uh, you can see um, uh, the channels, the 20 megahertz wide channels on 2.4 gigahertz only in 802.11g and the maximum data rate. Uh, it only has one spatial stream as well. Um, this is not how to do Wi-Fi in a hotel today. However, they're not alone. So I'm staying in a big hotel chain in uh, Dublin, and uh, this is how channel bonding on 2.4 gigahertz looks like. So you can see that they put channel one and six together, and channel uh, six and 11 together. So you can actually see here the channel bonding happening, 40 megahertz, happening in 2.4 gigahertz. And what you see is creating a very nice overlap channel there. So you will have lots of interference. So then I move to, uh, oh, by the way, this is uh, uh, one of the things that you will have if you use uh, home Wi-Fi routers in a business environment, okay? Business Wi-Fi routers do not support channel bonding in 2.4 gigahertz. Not a Ruckus, not a Aruba, not a Aerohive, not a Cisco. None of them support channel bonding uh, in 2.4. However, home routers do. Why? So they can put a bigger number on the box. That's why. Um, so I moved to San Francisco, and this is the Wi-Fi that I get in the hotel where I'm staying. Um, this is in Silicon Valley. It's in a big hotel chain. This is the Wi-Fi. Hmm. So, what you see here, 60 or 68 uh, uh, APs, um, all those APs, and this is the five gigahertz band. Nothing in five gigahertz, everything in 2.4. So, I went down to the IT manager, uh, well, to the manager of the hotel, and I said, you have an issue on your Wi-Fi. And she said, we know. <laughs> Good. That's a good thing. <laughs> so um, we explained uh, uh, what, what's the issue. I explained the, the 1, 6, and 11, and she actually, she really listened. Uh, she made notes, 
And uh, uh, I came back there. This is uh, uh, beginning of last year, beginning 2017. I took another scan. So this is the fixed Wi-Fi. I must say it's a lot better. Interesting facts. Um, there were no new access points. So she already had those access points, but no one ever enabled the five gigahertz band. All she did was put it in a controller and put in RRM. So she talked to the IT, uh, sorry, to her IT supplier as well. And um, she said, um, they solved the problem. And I must say, it was a lot better. And I said, so how did they solve it? And she said, they gave us more access points. Well, more access points is not the answer in this case. But just putting on the, the five gigahertz band really uh, made uh, the network a lot better. But if you put in more access points in an environment like this, you get co-channel interference. You, you get a lot of overlapping channels. So what's wrong? When you look at how Wi-Fi works, we have in this case an access point with five clients. And if I have one of those clients that says, I want to transmit data, he's doing a clear channel assessment. So basically he's raising the hand and says, I want to transmit data on the network. Then he will talk to the infrastructure and say, I'm gonna transmit for 570 milliseconds. Basically you're setting the timers for the other clients around you. Then the other clients will say, okay, for 570 milliseconds, I'm gonna shut up. Then he will get transmit the data and the access point will acknowledge it, and then they can move on. In uh, 2.4 gigahertz, we have to do the channel reuse, but you only have channel one, six, and 11. In five gigahertz, we have a lot more channels to reuse. So basically, if you want to do this, uh, uh, the channel reuse at the edge of the cell should be minus 67 dBm. There should be 86, oh, 86 dBm from the one edge of the cell to the center of the other cell on the same frequency and there should be minus 67 dBm to the edge of the cell again. So with this, you have a voice-ready network on 2.4 gigahertz. However, nowadays, you would do this on five gigahertz. On five gigahertz, planning is a lot easier. In this case, we took 40 megahertz wide channels, as you can see, and you can see that the channel reuse scheme is a lot better. Yes, if you're gonna move to 80 megahertz wide channels, it's gonna be a lot more difficult to get. So the best practices for channeling, only use 1, 6, and 11 on 2.4. If you have a, a voice, um, well, basically the, the, the advice is always use five gigahertz uh, as much as possible. But if you have voice environments, uh, voice phones, use the eight lower channels for voice because some of the phones do not support uh, the UNI2 and UNI3 uh, bands. Enable DCA, dynamic channel assignment. Enable dynamic bandwidth selection. Basically, that means the flexible DFS where the uh, access point will listen and see if DFS is being used and if you can use uh, uh, the higher bandwidths. Uh, use RRM and do not use maximum power. With that, we go to fill number two, maximum power. I use maximum power because I only have one access point. Uh, I use it because then I need less access points. I'm designing for coverage. This one is a favorite. I did a side survey and the tool says all green. Okay. And then of course, uh, it's the default. Uh, with some uh, vendors, the, the uh, access point, the maximum power is the default. Using APs on maximum power, uh, Jason Hintersteiner said it best. Jason Hintersteiner he now works for Ingenious. Uh, but he said, setting transmission power is like drinking scotch. The right amount is great, but more does not mean better, and too much will make you sick. Thank you, Jason. So putting your APs on maximum power is not a good idea. When I listen to music, I do not put it on maximum volume. Why? Because it's not good for uh, uh, the way the, the signal moves. The, the sound of your music on maximum volume is not good. Uh, you would not do that, and the same goes for uh, your access point. If you do that, maximum power equals 100 milliwatts. You will get a lot of co-channel interference. Uh, uh, keep in mind that the clients are not maximum power, so typically these devices are 14 dBm. 14 dBm means 25 milliwatts. And you will have reduced fault tolerance. Why? I'll explain, explain in a minute. So. 
here we have a client connected to an AP. Now, this client is moving in the building and comes to a point where you will have four APs nearby that will have a similar RSSI. So if this client is gonna be trying to connect to those other access points, he's gonna go through the four-way handshake and he will authenticate and associate with all those access points. And he will connect to you as an access point and then he will move to that one and he's not really sure if that one is not better or should I do it there? And he will move like this and if you're gonna do this for two hours, your battery will be dead. You can imagine. If you've been to a venue um, where uh, there's lots of booths, um, uh, a, 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 a trade show, a trade show. Have you noticed when you have your phone in your pocket that at that trade show your phone gets really warm? Have you ever noticed? Yeah? This is why your phone is trying to authenticate and associate to all those access points. And he really doesn't know which one to ignore and which one to connect to. So he's trying all of them. And he's gonna do that for a lot of time. And that's why it gets really warm and your battery dies in one and a half, two hours. So, another issue that we have is the near-far problem. We will have a client connected to an access point. And in this case, you will see that the client will have two bars on the Wi-Fi. It will show, hey, I am connected. See, it's in the, it's in the coverage area of the access point. So this AP is talking very loud, so I'm pretty sure they can hear me. This is an access point in the hallway of your hotel. The client is in the bedroom. And he does have coverage. But he talks back like this with a very soft voice. So does his message get back to the AP? No. So what's going to happen? He's going to retry. He's going to retry and retry. While he's doing that, this coverage area for the AP, sorry, for the client, will have a busy signal. So if there is a client here that wants to transmit and doing a clear channel assessment, he will see that the medium is busy. That is one of the issues that you face in your hotel Wi-Fi. Because this client cannot reach the access point, it's taking away the airtime because of all his retries, and a client that is connected here or connected here will have the same issue even though maybe that client is in the cell coverage area of the AP. <coughs> so putting your APs on a maximum power is never a good idea. Then RRM needs to scale power up and down in the case of a coverage hole, but if your access point is already on maximum power, there is nothing to scale. So what does RRM? It's dynamic channel assignment, it's transmit power control, but as said, if it's already, already on maximum power, there is nothing to control and there's coverage hole detection and mitigation. So it detects there's a coverage hole, but the AP is already a maximum power, so they cannot do anything about it. So the best practices for power, do not use 100% uh, uh, power. Use RRM at the maximum set to 17 dBm and a minimum of 15, uh, 5 dBm. Enable event-driven RRM with rogue Wi-Fi contribution. Keep the rogue duty cycle to a maximum of 80%. So if it, if it will detect a rogue AP with a, a, a 80%, it will change the channel. And basically um, create smaller cells. That is the recommendation. Um, RRM does not replace a side survey and it will not give you spectrum. Okay, that's an important thing to keep in mind. So, fail number three, 2.4 gigahertz is still the most important. I still have this conversation, yes? Can I use a question on maximum power, yes? Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, there's a, a session or a recommendation? You, you're, asking, you're asking about uh, uh, what if you uh, put a high gain antenna on an access point, right? A high gain antenna. Is that uh, um, a solution to the problem? The answer is no. The reason for that, with a high gain antenna, you create 
a larger coverage area, but that is downstream, okay? So the, the access point, still talking back to the client, is uh, having issue to reach the, the, the AP. So the answer is no. Uh, I would not recommend to use large, high gain uh, uh, antennas, especially not in an indoor environment. In an outdoor environment, it can be different. Yes? So 2.4 gigahertz is still the most important. Plain and simple, no, okay? I still have conversations with customers and they say we, we primarily design for 2.4 gigahertz and really that is not uh, how to do it. Some people will go as far and say uh, 2.4 gigahertz, it's dead. It died in 2015. Um, I really disagree on that. There are still uh, 2.4 gigahertz clients out there and especially with the new standards coming up like 802.11ax, we're gonna embrace 2.4 gigahertz again. So saying it's dead, it's definitely not the case. Uh, however, today you would design for five gigahertz. So only designing for 2.4 gigahertz is not how to do it. Um, all access points nowadays are dual radio. Dual radio means they will support 2.4. There's a feature called band steering or band select. Uh, some vendors call it band steering, some vendors call it band select. And basically what it does, it will push clients to the five gigahertz band. Well, honestly, it doesn't push a client. It will promote five gigahertz first. And if the client doesn't pick up the invitation to five gigahertz, then it will give uh, a 2.4 gigahertz effort. Uh, all the developments are on the five gigahertz band and not on 2.4 because there's just not enough channels and too much interference. So with that, I want every one of you to participate in this activity. I want you to raise your right hand with me. Thank you. And please say with me, I am a specialist, I know my stuff. <laughs> Come on, I'm a specialist, I know my stuff. And as a specialist, I pledge, I will no longer buy or sell 2.4 gigahertz single radio devices or access points. Thank you. So, 2.4 gigahertz best practices designed for five gigahertz. If possible, take out 2.4 entirely. Do not buy single radio APs, do not buy single radio clients. And if you have legacy clients, try to migrate them. Whenever possible, use flexible radio assignment. Flexible radio assignment is the possibility where your access point is having 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, uh, uh, but the, the secondary radio can be a 5 gigahertz as well. So you can have both radios in 5 gigahertz. I see more and more customer networks that have been designed with dual radio access points that have a lot of co-channel interference issues. So they hire an expensive wireless expert, you, and they do a site survey and they come up with a report and what does the report say? Take out half your radios. Really? So you invested dual radio access points, but then a specialist comes to take out half the radios. If you use an access point with flexible radio assignment, you can simply put those APs on dual five gigahertz. And with those dual five gigahertz, you will have better coverage, less co-channel interference, and basically a higher bandwidth and data rate. Fill number four, <clears throat> my favorite. So in my job, I'm a, I'm a sales specialist and um, um, I get invited to customers for two reasons. One, they have a very nice, big, prestigious project and they are uh, looking for advice and basically they want to show how awesome their project is gonna be. I love those conversations. And the other conversation is, you have to come to our premise now because your products suck. Okay. <laughs> I like those conversations as well. Um, I'm gonna show with you some, some pictures of uh, installations that went wrong. So, placement, does it matter? Yes. So here we see, uh, for instance, um, uh, um, access points behind a metal cage to protect the access point. They're very well protected. Nothing existed. What does a green light mean? No client connected, very good, yes. 
This one is a green light as well. The moment we moved this metal tile, it became blue. So you fixed it. We fixed it, yes. <laughs> fixed? <laughs> so yeah, placing your access points wrong is, uh, is, uh, is really an issue. Um, some examples uh, from uh, one of my customers. Um, by the way, my customer, he knows I'm using those uh, uh, fixtures. Um, he's a, a big manufacturer in France, and uh, he invited me to his, uh, uh, to his plant. And um, uh, he, he was never on site. He, only, uh, he was never on site for this particular area. Uh, he had many complaints from his IT staff and his people that the Wi-Fi really was bad. And uh, uh, we were having this conversation, and he said, please join me on a site visit. Uh, so I joined him. And uh, he knows I'm using these pictures as long as I don't mention his name. So, <clears throat> um, the wireless access points come with an installation kit, right? Does this installation kit mean duct tape? The answer is no. So, this is a wireless access point that they installed uh, on metal pipes. and. Um, it's a manufacturing environment, and lots of manufacturing environments generate dust, right? And dust and duct tape are not the best friends. So at a certain point, they come loose, and then you get pictures like this. So you see here an access point uh, hanging on a wire. <laughs> and then you see a different series of access points that they installed uh, um, as, um, wall mount on a metal, uh, metal wire uh, in a close distance of about two meter. And this is an access point that should be installed on the ceiling and they put it like this. So there's basically four errors in one picture. So then he took me to the manufacturing hall uh, where uh, he said this is a, a manufacturing hall. It was about a, a little bit bigger than this room. And um, he said, there are two access points installed in that room. They should be able to provide full coverage in that area. And I'm like, yeah, you're, you're right. Two access points should be sufficient to cover an area like this. So we walked into that hall, and uh, we found the first access point. It was in the corner, in the corner, right above the metal pipe. So let's say it was there, right above the metal pipe. And it didn't provide enough coverage in the area. I can understand that. But he said, but there should be another one. And it took us a while to look around and find it, and we found it. So it was in the middle, on a metal wire, upside down. It's not really the access point that's causing the problem here. So he, he said, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's not the access points. It's the installation. So, what's wrong? Uh, there are two different types of access points. There's the access points for carpeted antennas and for ruggedized environments, and uh, ruggedized environments are the ones with uh, external antennas. And um, they are designed for installing on the ceiling. It is important to realize that uh, you install that the right way, okay? It has to do with the polarization of the antenna. Now, um, access points that have been properly installed. Uh, this is in the, uh, the London subway. London subway is a very difficult, harsh environment. But look at how the antennas are installed. The antennas are pointing down. This is how to do it. Uh, this is the um, airport in Austria. Uh, this is, again, how to do it. It's a metal wire where they installed it on, but there's a a wooden plate behind the access points. So uh, any uh, uh, signal bouncing off the antenna is absorbed by the wooden plate, okay? So th this is how to properly install it. Um, not so well done. Um, apparently, um, our access points, uh, I, I know a lot of the features that we have. I don't know all of them. Um, so I've, I heard that one of them is uh, uh, stacking. And everyone knows that stacking has to happen in the wiring closet. <laughs> and if you want to install your access point outdoor, 
um, you can buy an outdoor IP, but you can also do it the MacGyver way. Yeah, it works. No, seriously, if you want to install access points, uh, uh, look at uh, how to use the antennas and where to put the antennas, putting antennas down and up. That's how we uh, designed it. Uh, for the new ones, the 2800, 3800s, again, antennas up and, uh, up and down. Uh, you can see our access points here as well. If they have the antennas, you see them up and down. Does it matter? Yes. This is a coverage cell from the same access point uh, with the antenna horizontal polarized and vertical polarized. And you see that the coverage area really makes a difference. So don't do it like this. You should use always uh, uh, one type of antenna. And if you want to uh, cut costs, do not cut them on not buying the antenna. By the way, there is a full website called badfi.com and you will find loads of those kind of pictures. So best practices for placing, put your APs horizontal, below obstructions, minimal one meter away from uh, obstructions with only one type of antenna, uh, three meter away from each other, not too high. So if you're gonna go higher than four meter, you need to do special implementations. Uh, do not put them behind a metal cage. There are lots of ways like for instance, Oberon has got solutions to prevent uh, those access points, but do not put them uh, behind the metal cage. And use outdoor APs for outdoor coverage. All right, film number five is about encryption and authentication. Um, it's uh, not giving enough attention to uh, security. So I took this picture in uh, one of the very large public uh, service uh, uh, customers uh, in, uh, in Brussels. And uh, what surprised me is that uh, they advertised the SSID and the username and the password. And what surprised me most is that I could just take a picture of it. They saw me take a picture of it and they didn't stop me. That, that surprised me. So this is an interesting one uh, to uh, check for yourself as well. It's called wiggle.net. Uh, Wiggle.net, and it's collecting, in this case, uh, 400 million uh, unique Wi-Fi networks. Uh, you can go onto this website and type in your home address, and you will find all the Wi-Fi networks around your house. You will see how they are secured. All that information is uh, there. It's very shocking to see how much data there is. Uh, what you see here is that 60, let's say 61% of the Wi-Fi networks are right now on WPA2. That means that uh, uh, one third of the, all the wireless infrastructures are not properly secured. For your information, this is the picture from last year. So we see that we went up from 228 million and we went from 52% of the WPA2 network. So we see that WPA2 is uh, uh, increasing. Another interesting fact is here, you see really the inflection point of when uh, uh, Wi-Fi became popular. It, it really was 2010 when this started happening. Um, about web encryption, um, I had a lot of questions about WPA2 encryption uh, lately, and everyone knows that if you simply go to web encryption, you're not afraid of being cracked. Um, this is a Kaspersky picture and it tells you that in uh, the US you see that a lot of the networks are low or no security. We're, we're pretty okay here in Europe except for France and Portugal um, but it shows that there are a lot of networks still not properly secured. So field number five is about not enough attention for encryption. Uh, basically in, in summary we have to uh, follow encryption methods um, and I would, I would recommend everyone to use WPA2 with AES and CCMP. Why would you not use TKIP? I will explain in a minute. Um, so securing Wi-Fi, when we're securing Wi-Fi, you, you have to secure the infrastructure. That basically means that you make sure that the wireless LAN controller cannot be, uh, be accessed. Uh, you have uh, 802.1x port authentication. Um, basically, you're securing the infrastructure and you make sure that no client can be, or no access point can be inserted into uh, that infrastructure. You can secure the air, 
and basically have wireless intrusion prevention and clean air. And then, of course, you have to secure the client where you make sure that authentication and encryption is happening on the client level and you use uh, VPN uh, uh, software. Um, there's a very good detailed session by uh, Federico Siloto. Uh, I would recommend everyone to visit that session uh, to uh, uh, have all the details about securing Wi-Fi. So WPA2 is the bare minimum. With CCMP, do not use TKIP. The reason for that, not because TKIP is not secure, but the moment you enable TKIP, you degrade the performance to 54 megabits per second. So even though you have the fastest, highest grade uh, access point, you degrade the performance. WPA2 personal is for personal, so it's really uh, about the pre-shared key is for home use. Use 802.1x for enterprises, use role-based access with ICE, and use wireless intrusion prevention to uh, protect your RF environment. And then, of course, if you're on a public wireless infrastructure, please use a VPN. So, fail number six, hype versus reality. I want you to realize what is marketing and what's the truth. The reason for that, if you have certain expectations of products and you feel yourself being king of the world, and in reality, it's a little bit different. You're disappointed in uh, what's there. So I want you to understand uh, uh, what is real and what is, uh, uh, what is marketing. So we all want those big, shiny numbers, right? Um, so let's have a quick look at how this starts. So there's the IEEE. The IEEE comes out with the standards. Then there's the Wi-Fi alliance that makes sure there's uh, interoperability between the two of them. And then there's the different vendors that have uh, uh, their own unique selling points. Obviously, uh, Cisco is my favorite one. Um, so um, uh, the IEEE publishes the very technical documents. Uh, Wi-Fi alliance makes sure that if uh, you use an AP from one vendor and a client from another vendor, they work together. And then, of course, uh, uh, the vendors have their own differentiated features. So let's have a look at 802.11ac. Um, it's there, uh, wireless gigabit, and I'm so excited! But in order to get to the speed of 1.3 gig, it really makes, uh, 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 we need those advanced features. So in order to get to 1.3 gig, we need to have 80 megahertz wide channels, we need to have the 256 QAM constellation and basically all those features like clean air, client link, and all those HDX features really uh, start to matter. Uh, basically, you need to be close to the dartboard, right? You need to be close to the dartboard and there should be no interference, no clients around you that take you out of your concentration. That's basically what we need. So then we have wave two. And when we're talking about wave two, wave two is really about 160 megahertz wide channels, four spatial streams, and a thing called multi-user MIMO. So, 160 megahertz wide channels, is it the solution to our problems? No. When we look at where we are here in Europe, we can see that we can only use one non-overlapping 160 megahertz wide channel. Is this number increasing? Yes, we're working very hard on it, but it's not so easy as it is in the US. In the US, there's one organization called the FCC, and the FCC says, we're gonna do it this way. These are the channels. In Europe, we have the Spanish, we have the Italian, we have the English, the Belgian, the Dutch, the German, and they have to agree on how we do this. That's not so easy, okay? So, we're working a lot on getting more channels available on five gigahertz band, but that's not the case yet. So looking at the actual data rate that we can get, um, the 80 megahertz wide channels with uh, um, 64 QAM, we get to 980, we get to 1.3 gig in AC. Oh. Um, to get to the very high numbers, we need to have the 160 megahertz. But then you can see the 6.9 that's been mentioned in uh, the slides about uh, the maximum standard in 802.11ac. But in order to get there, we need to have eight spatial streams. So that is where the 6.9 gig comes from. But the standard says it's there, yes. And there will be in future infrastructure devices that make it possible, but not on a client's perspective. Multi-user MIMO. Up till now, it's been single-user MIMO. I talk to you, and you acknowledge my message, and then I move to the next one. Talk to you, 
That's single user MIMO. Multi-user MIMO means that I can talk to three clients at the same time. However, it's downstream only, okay? So the upstream communication is still single user MIMO. By the way, in 802.11ax, the standard that's coming in the future, near future, that will be uh, multi-user MIMO up and down. However, how many clients are there today that support multi-user MIMO? One, yes. Um, I do believe that multi-user MIMO is a feature that's gonna be beneficial to all of us in the near future, so it is something to keep in mind. However, it's not of a very common use today. So, 802.11 AC wave two, what to do? Uh, wave two adds three main features, four spatial streams, multi-user MIMO, 160 megahertz uh, channels. And uh, uh, what I want to emphasize to you is that a wave two will give you uh, uh, these advantages. So the higher data rate, higher data rate, wider channels, simultaneous data delivery, and basically because you have faster transmission, you have a better battery life. However, our 2800 and 3800 access points add high density features like the flexible radio assignment, clean air, application visibility control, flexible DFS, MGIG, uh, improved client link, uh, location optimized roaming, fast lane for integration with uh, Apple devices. And what I want to emphasize to you is look at the features from HDX, the high density experience. They are, they are far more important than just the application visibility and control. Uh, sorry, than the Wave 2 uh, features. So the overview of the access points, we have them in the world of solutions where you can see all of them, including uh, the uh, sensor. Um, best practices for high versus reality, simply look at uh, uh, the advanced features in HDX and uh, use the access point that fits your need. Okay, so don't bite yourself into Wave 2, look at uh, beyond Wave 2, and especially nowadays with software-defined access and assurance. Fail number seven, of course I did a side survey. So a conversation that I have with a lot of customers is, yes, of course I did a side survey. And when you ask them what they did, they had their phone connected to the Wi-Fi and were looking at how big is the coverage cell from their phone. That's not a side survey. So there are different types of side surveying. Uh, predictive, pre-deployment, post-deployment, and periodic. And basically, you're answering different kind of questions. So how many APs are there? How does the RF world look like? And uh, does it actually work? Um, so different types of connectivity. You uh, answer different uh, uh, um, uh, survey. You survey for interference. Uh, you do a passive survey. You do an active survey where you just walk around connected to one AP, and you look at the performance, uh, uh, performance testing. So for... Wi-Fi, we created the survey happiness scale. Uh, the happiness scale is based on uh, Jim Carrey. You guys know Jim Carrey? So with no survey, Jim Carrey is very unhappy. With a post-deployment validation, he's happy. With predictive and uh, AP on a stick, he's very happy. We used to create this uh, uh, happiness scale with Paris Hilton, but it didn't work out because it was never really clear if she was happy or not. So, uh, another question that we get a lot is how fast can you walk? With one adapter, you can sl walk slow. With two, you have to walk fast. And if you want to do a quick survey for a large area, it's better to use uh, uh, things like an, uh, a Segway where you can actually do a lot of uh, stuff at the same time. Make sure that you survey and know what's there. So if, the, uh, if, if you think it's a drywall, but there's a brick in between, then uh, you will have an issue because the damping is a lot uh, bigger. And, uh, People think, uh, people uh, forget the most important place where they need Wi-Fi, and that is actually the restroom, which is the most common place where people use Wi-Fi. There's been a survey around that, yes. Uh, predictive survey is not a side survey, it's a design, and you cannot see interference. Uh, in a predictive survey, we've had a situation with a design company where uh, the uh, aquarium was not on the plan, and the Wi-Fi didn't work. Why? Absorption of the signal. Okay. Um, so an active survey, you can, you can do a connected AP on a stick. Uh, these are bring your, uh, do it yourself, uh, active on a stick. This is a uh, survey kit that you can buy. By the way, if you are going to check this in at the airport, you have to call them up front, otherwise you have an issue. 
<coughs> so uh, some common practices on surveying. Basically, um, put your, your uh, survey channels only on the channels that you will use. So 1, 6, and 11, and put them on, uh, in this case, uh, uh, faster speed. So put them in 105 milliseconds. Otherwise, you will have uh, a, a lot of um, delay. So you have to work on both sides of uh, a building. In this case, it's a warehouse, and you walk on both uh, areas. If not, you will not have a proper uh, coverage uh, cell. Um, interference, I'm going to show tomorrow in the session in detail how the interference actually looked like. Uh, um, we can do a spectrum analysis, so basically you're looking at what's going on in the spectrum. You can use air magnet for that. You can use a, 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 a channelizer by MetaGeek. And uh, you can use your clean air access points to, uh, to do that. There are wireless troubleshooting tools, like uh, the air pickup card to capture packets. Uh, you can use a Wireshark. Everyone loves Wireshark. And if you have a Mac, you can install a tool called AirTool by Adrian Granados. And uh, you can actually capture uh, packets right away from the air. So the best practices on Wi-Fi, basically, you need to do all surveys. And a survey is really, really important. And please keep in mind Spectrum. All right, I'm really rushing through the last minutes. I'm sorry for that. Um, but um, we're almost there. You're almost a wireless superhero. Um, but there's one more field that I want to share with you, and that is about uh, certifications. Get yourself certified, OK? Wi-Fi is a specialty, and we really need those specialists. So start reading about 802.11. There are very good uh, um, uh, blogs, uh, independent blogs, uh, blogs by Wi-Fi specialists that work for certain vendors. Please start reading about it because they're really, really nice to read. The uh, fun uh, community as well, the wireless industry community, uh, uh, because we really need those wireless specialists, OK? Uh, we are now coming into the area where Wi-Fi is, uh, is so important. So get yourself certified. For Cisco, there's CCNA, CCMP, and uh, CCIE. If you want to become a, a vendor independent, there's CW, uh, CWMP. Um, I created for you the seven ways to fill checklist. So you can reach out to me on Twitter or email or, or find me on, on LinkedIn and get the seven ways to fill checklist. Um, I did a little bit of rebranding because tomorrow we're going to have seven new ways. Uh, so I now did a rebranding. It's called seven, uh, four, uh, 14, uh, Famous 14. So I have an overview with all the uh, seven fills, uh, 14 fills. So sorry that I had to rush those last minutes. You've learned seven things when you are an expert, and seven things when you hire an expert. But if you look, keep in mind that hiring a professional is still cheaper than hiring an amateur. But if you search very well, there's always someone willing to do it cheaper. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>